Welcome everybody to tonight's program of Expanding Your Family History Journey. Um, as Elizabeth said, I uh, actually came from Florida, but um, now I am currently here at the Genealogy Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And um, so with this program, we are going to actually start with discussing um, some of the basic beginner stuff. So those of you who are joining us tonight who are new, um, there is some basic beginning stuff here at the beginning part of the program, but then we're going to kind of go a little further and that's where the expanding your family history journey part comes in, where we are going to be actually going more in depth and exploring these individuals. So, it all begins with you. And I know for many of us, when we first hear this in genealogy, it's like, all right, yeah, it begins with me, but I can't find stuff about myself as easily. Well, it begins with you. It begins with the stuff that you remember, the things you recall hearing, images, stories, and things that you can go and talk to people about now, because it really is about you. And the thing is, is this is your story. It's your story, whether it's about your family who came long before you, to your parents, to your nowadays. And so think about the things about yourself that impact your daily life. And then think about what actually impacted your ancestors. So when you begin, you start with yourself and you then start looking for certain details. And the details we all get familiar with are things like names. And I love the name game because here's the thing with names. Names are first names, middle names, initials, people choosing their middle names over their first names, people choosing their nicknames and all those various surnames that are possibilities, and especially when talking about our females and multiple marriages. There's so many names. And the thing is, the names truly at times can be what that person on the other side who's filling in the paperwork is hearing. And so when we are looking for names, one of the first rules is to think of all the variant spellings, think of how it could be misheard, miswritten, how um, someone's poor handwriting, letters that could have been mismatched, as well as, well, family members who like to alter their names. This happens a lot in history and in our historical documents, and we need to be aware of that. If we are searching for a certain spelling of a name, we are immediately going to have problems. Dates and places for things like birth, marriage, and death, the three critical events that take place in our lives, um, become the next things that we are looking for when we start our journey. Here's the dilemma that happens. We start just looking for names, dates, and places. Now remember, I started by saying, this is your story. Are you just a name, a date, and a place? Well, neither is your ancestors. And so, yes, this is our starting point, our foundation, but we have to go further. Talk to everybody. Talk to everybody you can possibly speak to who is connected to the family in order to learn more, in order to understand more about your family People share all kinds of stories. I've gotten into a very, very bad habit with my family where I carry around either a recorder when we're getting together for family events, or I have a recording on my phone. So that way, when they start telling some story that I will never remember the facts from, I record it, therefore I can remember it. And yes, I do ask their permission to record before I record. We need to reevaluate our research every step of the way, whether we are a beginner, we've been doing this 
for years. We've been doing this for decades. We need to reevaluate. When I first asked my parents for stuff they had in their home pertaining to our family, I was told they didn't have anything. Until one day, my mother informs me she has this, like, it was a book of recipes that, well, lo and behold, had a bunch of letters stuffed into it. Letters involving her Smith family. As you can imagine, that was very beneficial to the family historian. But when I asked if they had anything at the house initially, mom didn't think of, the, of that as something I'd be interested in. We need to reevaluate even how we ask for things. We need to relook at those photos, our scrapbooks that we have, those front matter of our church books that we have where we've written or our people before us wrote family members. Oh, isn't it wonderful when we find diaries? Or sometimes it's not so wonderful, but that is our legacy. And those letters, those documents that family members might have from each other that tells the tales that we are interested in. We need to reevaluate every step of our research. For the beginners, you need to keep track of your geological endeavors because immediately it starts to get a bit confusing for you as well as for those who might be assisting you such as us librarians. So here we have a family group record. This is used to document an actual family unit of husband and wife and children. And so it's just a basic form to help keep things straight. You can use these kinds of forms. You can create your own forms. And of course, an ancestral chart, which most of us are familiar with seeing. But the thing with the ancestral chart is it's just that direct line. And if you just focus on your direct line, you are once again going to run into trouble because sometimes there isn't the information available in your direct line but your direct ancestor is discussed and named and all the details are available in their brother or sister's records. And so we have to branch out outside of that straight line. So I'd like to introduce you to my parents, Gladys and Joe. They were married in 1971 and I here have name, date, and place. I have the critical information I can move on. Except there's a story that was always told about their wedding day. My mother is notoriously known for being tardy. And I had always been told whenever people would get frustrated when we were leaving and mom was running behind, we would be told, well, you know, your mother was late to our wedding. And so I knew this extra little fact about their wedding day besides the name, date, and place. Well, could I just stay with that little piece of information? I could have, but then I would have missed out on this. I want to share with you, as I said, I keep a recorder with me when I'm at family events. And so please don't mind the extra sounds, um, clicking sounds that keep appearing. But I'm going to play for you a conversation that took place in a hotel room with my family. Describe your wedding day. Describe my wedding day? Yep. Oh my God. I'll tell you, she was late. I was. There was a lot of anger behind that. <laughs> okay, my wedding day. I looked. And it wasn't just a little bitty, like five minutes. I was 15 minutes late. Oh. How late was she, Dad? I don't remember to tell you the truth, but it was a, seemed like a long time. Let me put it that way. Yeah, his best man, Ed, was telling. She's not coming. <laughs> okay. I was late because of Kenny. Well, what did he do? Kenny was supposed to pick me up there. Oh, you never showed up? <laughs> I don't know the reason why we were late too late. Okay. Uh, I worked that day. And, I did too. Uh, I was on time. 
If I had just stuck with names, dates, and places, I would have missed out on that conversation where I got these extra details about their wedding day. And honestly, I got to hear my father for the first time truly express emotion about the fact she was late. And I'm not sure if you could hear his quip when she said that she had to work that day. He commented, so did he, and he wasn't late. I would have missed out on that. That's a story. That's my family story. That's my family. And so these are the things that we miss out on when we're not looking to expand our family history, when we're not looking to find out more about these individuals who are more than names, dates, and places. Describe your wedding day. Oops, sorry. Describe my wedding day. Yep. So, we are now going to go and take a look at an example of starting off with what is a basic document most of us use and expanding that research on the family through various generations. So here we have Ancestry.com which you can either purchase on your own, you can um, see about getting access at your local public library, and we do have available here to use in our buildings at the Allen County Public Library. And so when you're on Ancestry, we just begin our searching, and today we are gonna search for Maggie Norwood, and she lived in North Carolina her entire life. And so when I get my first results, I can limit my categories. But the thing is, is I really need to pay attention. There are three Maggie Norwoods in North Carolina in 1930. I have to pay attention which one is the one I'm looking for. Based on different details I might know, I can start to limit the date range for the birth. And so I will actually select the one that's in the middle. When I do, I go through the census record in which I find Maggie here with her daughter, Maddie, and it says her son, Radcliffe. I'm sorry to tell you that even on the original documents, they make mistakes. Radcliffe is actually her grandson. So I'm also told that Maggie owns property valued about $3,500. Based on that, I know I can search for a variety of property records to learn more about that property she owns. I'm given their ages. I've given the fact that the two women are widows. And I'm given the ages they were at the time of their first marriage. Based on these details, I can calculate birth, I can calculate marriage dates possibly for them, and I can calculate when their spouses died, at least that they died prior to 1930. I'm told where they individually were born, where their fathers were born, and where their mothers were born. I'm told their occupation and what kind of industry. So I see here that Maddie, the daughter, is a manager at a boarding house, but that Maggie is a housekeeper at the boarding house. And this can lead me to different types of business records. And then this final question in 1930 was asking about serving in the military, um, serving in a war, and Radcliffe said yes. In 1930, he had served in the World War. Well, in 1930, the World War was World War I. Based off that, I can then look for military type records for him. So based off of just this one initial document, which is typically a document we start with in genealogy, because if you have someone who's born back this time period, you can start tracing through the census records. But based off this, I now have that Margaret married a person named Norwood. She has a daughter named Maddie. 
um, and that Maddie was married to someone's last name, Lanius, and that they had a child named Radcliffe Lanius. So using that actual record and looking at the abstract that Ancestry provides, I can actually scroll down past the abstract to where Ancestry gives me the option of suggested records. And so looking at this, it looks like, yes, there's so many records I can look up for her. And boy, I can just go and start finding more and more information and absolutely take advantage of the fact that this is provided for you, but also take it with a grain of salt. Verify that you are looking at the right person because this is a computer determining that this is the right person. Recall that when we first looked for her, there were three Maggie Norwoods in 1930 in North Carolina. How do we know if we are on the right track with this? We have to just verify the information that we already know with the records that they provide before we move on. We also need to look at the records they provide us. So here we have an option of a North Carolina death certificate. And when we look at it, here we find Margaret. And so we have the death certificate for Mrs. Margaret. Her name is Poe X. Line Norwood. She died April 2nd, 1940. She is the widow of a J.C. Norwood. She was born May 30th of 1856 in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And it also notes here her occupation. She's the manager of the X-Line Hotel. Her father is listed as J.C. Poe of Fayetteville, North Carolina. And her mother is Margaret McLean of Harnett County. Here's the abstract for that death certificate. I want to show you something. Look at her name. Look at how it looked on the actual certificate and then the proper spelling of her name that I've provided you. Whoever indexed this believed that the middle name there was Pow instead of Poe and Erline instead of Xline. That would make a difference in two of her potential last names. Her birthplace, look at how the abstract has it listed versus the actual document and the spelling I provided you. And her father, the abstract has her as J.C. Powell. It's written, it does look like a possible L, but it's J.C. Poe. Just want to show you because when you are searching and typing in names, these are the names, the birthplaces, so forth, that the computer is trying to connect to. This is why sometimes you have a hard time finding information because not only is it the original record, it's someone trying to read the original record and then provide the information for indexing purposes. So from that record, I did learn that Margaret Poe was at some point married to someone named Xline because she's got that last name. I have that her parents are J.C. Poe and Margaret McLean. And that she eventually at some point married J.C. Norwood since Norwood was the last name on that death certificate. And it's the name that she provided that she was the widow of. So there are a number of records we can look at now just from looking at two potential records on Ancestry. Because we don't want to just know the names, dates, and places. We want to know so much more about these people. So just kind of looking at familysearch.org, which is a free site as long as you create an account. So you can sign in with your free account. You can search and they have a variety of types of things that you can search on their site. If you were to search by a location, you could search for North Carolina and get a listing of all the types of records they have for North Carolina. 
So if I was looking for, say, the military records since Radcliffe served in World War I, Family Search has the World War I service cards for North Carolina. Taking a look at those, I then learned Radcliffe Lanius enlisted through the National Guard at Pittsburgh, North Carolina on July 17th of 1917. I'm given where he was born, the organizations he was a part of, so his unit, which becomes very important when doing searching for military, the grade levels he held while in service, as well as um, the time period he served overseas and when he was honorably discharged. All these details off of basically what is a card index to what he did in the service. As you can see on the left-hand side here, the abstract for this record does not provide as much detail off the record. So you do need to look at these records in case that one, someone misread what was written and you need to make sure that you are looking and discovering the accurate information or the possible catching of misspellings. But also because sometimes as you can see, these indexes and abstracts do not provide all that relevant data we are looking for. So you have to look at the record. Another thing is the um, document information, finding out the actual source, being able to actually know if something came up and you needed to look at this again, knowing where you found it. And I like that I can just copy this citation and put it in my notes. And I know where I found this information so I can look back if I need to, if for some reason a question pops up in my head. And also on Family Search, just like with Ancestry, they do have these similar records for other people with the same kind of name. Once again, it's a computer making these decisions. And so you do have to once again, take it with a grain of salt and look at the record yourself and look at the other facts to determine if it's the right person. Looking at the original rec the census record we started with, we saw that Maggie Norwood was a widow. And so we can look and find Maggie and Maddie in the marriage records. Here we have the actual marriage license for Maddie R. X. Line of Pittsburgh, North Carolina, and Jack C. Lanius of Nashville, Tennessee. Maddie was born about 1875 based on her age of 21 years old at this time. She is the daughter of L.R. Exline and Margaret Exline of Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Jack was born roughly about 1869 to J.C. Lanius and Mary J. Lanius, and Mary is deceased. The families of Nashville, Tennessee. The, the couple was married on January 8th of 1896 at the home of LRX Line in Pittsburgh, Chatham County, North Carolina. So we have all these details off their marriage record. And so we can actually start filling in that tree more with more information, including the name of Maddie's father. We can also, looking at the marriage records, take a look to see if we can find a marriage license for Mr. Exline and his wife, Maggie, in which we find this license where Maggie A. Poe was born about 1856 to John C. and Margaret J. Poe of Cross Creek Township. And Laban R. Exline, was born about 1840 to Solomon J. and Jane S. Exline of Virginia, and Jane is deceased at the time of this wedding. They were married on October 9th of 1873 at the home of Major A. McLean in Cross Creek, Cumberland County, North Carolina. Now, what does this tell us? It's names, dates, and places. But I can tell you something. I can tell you that Laban served in the military. And so the fact that he's being married at the residence of Major A. McLean, I want to know who Major A. McLean is. 
because if he is hosting their wedding at his home, I want to know their relationship. I can assume they know each other from the military, but I would need to search more to make sure if they served in the same unit and so forth. But based off that record, I can just once again start expanding out this family tree. Look, we just only looked at five records so far and look at this family tree that we have created here. So what more could we learn? What more can we expand on on this family? Well, according to that census record, Maggie owned property. So let's take a look at some of those land records that are out there. Here we have a land record that appears in Chatham County, North Carolina. And it says that we, John A. Hanks, C.W. Hanks, and Thomas A. Hanks, for and in consideration of the premises and of the sum of $800 to us in hand, paid by LRX line, the receipt of which we do hereby acknowledge. Just, and it's for the purchase of this property, described lot or parcel of land lying and being in the county of Chatham in the town of Pittsburgh, in as follows. On the east by Hillsborough Street, on the south by the stretch dividing said lot, from the lot now occupied by Miss Kate Hanks and Mrs. Horn, and known in the last made plat, of said town of Pittsboro as Hank Street, on the west by the lands of Alvis J. Bynum, and on the north by the land of Mrs. May Palmer. And so we are given this detail and that it contains two acres more or less, and that this document is dated February 22nd, 1887. So based on that description of the land, would I be able to determine where the X lines were living or where this property was that they purchased? Would I be able to determine, is this where that hotel was that she owned? Well, here using Google Maps, I was able to determine Hank Street in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, Hillsboro Street, and based on the description they provided of which street was um, west and south, that the property was west and um, north of, here is where the property sat. So if I wanted to learn more about this property, I could start looking at the local information. What does the lo local library, local historical society, local geological society might have? For me to learn more about this family, about the hotel they owned, and so forth. It's as simple, and I know you're going to be shocked I'm saying this, as Googling to determine the different organizations in that region for me to possibly contact. So here the Chatham County Historical Association actually has a whole section of their website dedicated to preservation efforts in the town including the documents from when they filed for a whole section to be named the Pittsburgh Historic District as part of the National Register of Historic Districts or Historic Places. In the location description, it's those bounding of the Hillsborough and Hanks Streets. So I got all excited thinking I found it, yes. I did find it, but I found something I was like, okay, it's okay. The X-Line Hotel, which opened in the late 1890s at the northwest corner of Hanks and Hillsborough Streets, continued to operate as a hotel or boarding house until the 1940s, is now demolished. So I at least now know the property of where this hotel that the family owned and managed for a number of years resided. I now have an actual deed record of when they purchased the property. And I now know when the property was about roughly when the property was demolished. Because she is a widow, 
and properties involved, I have to wonder about probate. So I look for wills and estate papers in Chatham County. And lo and behold, here I find January 14th of 1922, I, J.C. Norwood, being of sound mind, but considering the uncertainty of my earthly existence, he went ahead and wrote a will. First, my executor named shall give my body a decent burial suitable to the wishes of my friends and relatives and pay all funeral expenses together with and my just debts out of the first monies which may come into his hands belonging to my estate. The second item in his will is I give and devise to my beloved wife, Mrs. J.C. Norwood, all of my real and personal property of any and all kinds that I possess at the time of my death. Oddly enough, there is not a third section to the will. It jumps from the second item to the fourth item of the will. The fourth item is I hereby constitute and appoint my trusty friend, W.P. Horton, my lawful executor. So W.P. Horton went ahead and handled the dispersal of J.C. Norwood's property. And when he did, he actually had to file documentation with the court pertaining to that dispersal. And he had to provide an explanation for every piece of the estate and where it went and what it was used to pay for what. And he had to provide receipts. So there is actually um, about a 16 to 17 page packet a variety of receipts and documentation pertaining to what Mr. Horton did in dispersing Mr. Norwood's property. Among those papers and receipts are these checks from the actual estate fund to Mrs. J.C. Norwood. This first one is from July 29th, 1927, where she is receiving $100 as part payment of the legacy of J.C. Norwood's estate. And then we have here March 10th of 1928 that she is being paid $500 once again as part of this trust fund for her was absolutely fabulous besides the fact of seeing that she was being supported by her husband was the fact that these are checks. And think about what we do with checks. Mrs. J.C. Norwood signed the backs of these checks. Sometimes when we're looking at documents, we're not sure, is that the clerk's is signature there or is that my ancestors and so forth. This is actually a signature from someone's ancestor. Another great place to start searching, as we saw earlier, for some of this information is newspapers. So here at the Allen County Public Library, we have access to newspapers.com. Other local libraries do as well, or you can purchase your own account. In it, you can search for things like the wedding announcements. Here we have from 1873, in Fayetteville on the 8th at the residence of Major Archibald McLean by Reverend H.G. Hill, Mr. L.R. Exline and Miss Maggie A. Poe were married. And then we have the announcement from 1921 for her second marriage. Pittsburgh had the greatest surprise sprung on it Saturday night it has had for years when Mrs. L.R. Exline, proprietor of the Exline Hotel and J.C. Norwood, a former boarder, slipped out the back way from a house full of boarders and were quietly married at the home of Mrs. J.C. Lanius, daughter of the bride, Reverend Jonas Barclay, par pastor of the bride, Reverend, uh, sorry, pastor of the Presbyterian Church, performed the ceremony. Immediately after the ceremony was over, the boarders were on and armed themselves with rice, 
Upon the return of a happy couple who still thought their secret wasn't out, were met at the front porch with showers of rice. Mr. Norwood spent the winter and spring here in surveying the state highway roads. Mrs. Norwood is the owner and proprietor of the well-known X-Line Hotel. So here we have two of her wedding announcements and especially in the second one, much more detail. And so we have this whole thing. First off, um, if you notice in the marriage license application, he is considerably younger than her. Here he is, he is working on um, the roads um, and he's a surveyor and he's staying in her hotel and lo and behold, they get married. And she actually is the owner of this hotel that we know when she started owning the property. And we know that she still is having this hotel in 1930 census. And according to that um, Chatham County Historical Society article, um, paperwork, she, that the hotel was in existence in, through the 40s. So, so much detail just from reading the articles and seeing what else we found from other historical possibilities that are open to us. Here's another newspaper article. This time is from a newspaper in Raleigh, North Carolina, in which they are actually um, documenting some of the big famous things going on in um, the state. And one of them includes the X-Line House, a leading hotel on Hillsborough Street in Pittsboro, North Carolina. The X-Line House is truly the traveling man's retreat. That clever lady, Mrs. X-Line, is the proprietress. The hotel is conveniently situated in the business part of town. No better house so far as table or rooms are concerned can be enjoyed by traveling public anywhere in the state, and the good hostess looks after everything herself. Attached to the hotel is a first-class livery. So this is just to kind of show you this actual article in the paper is actually from August 29th, 1897. And so this article is actually like almost 10 years after they bought that property. So look at all this that you start to learn about people just by starting to expand out and look for more information about them. So when we discussed other records to search, starting off with just a basic census record, we expanded out and we looked at marriage records. We looked at two death records. We looked at deeds. We looked at wills. We looked at probate records. We looked at an actual service card for World War I service, and we looked at newspaper articles pertaining to the marriages and pertaining to the business itself. And look at all the ones that I do not have in red that are still waiting to be looked at pertaining to this one family unit. You can expand your research, find out more, because at the end of the day, it's about the story. So next up, let's discuss connecting with a current family. So here is an anniversary announcement for a 50th wedding anniversary in which the couple was married um, in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania in 1968. And the groom is Terry and he is the son of Henry, Bob, and Mabel Hot, and the bride is Patty, or Patricia, and she's the daughter of Robert and Phyllis Jean Stusen. And Terry has three, had three siblings, Gary Lee, Darlene, and Cindy. Um, Gary Lee died in Vietnam in 1969, and Patty has a brother, Dallas. So from here, we can do a family tree where we have the couple, the bride and groom, and their parents listed. But if we want to learn more, we're talking about family that really is kind of current. Um, stuff involving their lives is their deaths are current and other aspects of their 
daily lives, even including the Vietnam War death, is still deemed somewhat current when we're looking at records. So here, once again, at the Allen County Public Library, we have access to America's Genealogy Bank, and other public libraries have access to this as well, so check with your local library, or you can pay for a subscription to it, in which look for Mabel Hot just to see what information I could find knowing that um, America's Genealogy Bank has an obituary um, collection that is more current than other newspaper sites, in which I find actually two citations for Mabel. Um, it's because she appeared in the paper twice, but it's the same article, in which we get Mabel Maxine Wright Hotz, so we get her maiden name, that she was born in White Oak to Clarence Dewey and Ida Floyd Wright. She is survived by three children, Terry, Patricia, and Cindy. In addition to her parents, Mabel is preceded in death by her husband. So now we know he died before April of 2017 and that they had been married for 62 years. So we can calculate the date of their marriage. Her husband's name was Henry Robert. She also is preceded in death by a son, SP5, Gary Lee, who died in Vietnam, three brothers, Robert, Paul, and Harold Ray Wright, and two sisters, Dorothy and Barbara Jean, who died in an accident at age three. That is a lot of great detail in that obituary on the other family members that we could expand out on. But here's the thing that's really great about this particular obituary indexing. I also find Mabel indexed in Charles Toothman's death obituary. Once again, he had two and two separate dates, but it's the same one in which, well, why is she appearing in his? Well, because his brother-in-law is Robert Hott, whose wife is Mabel. Then she also appears in Dorothy Ellen Wright, in which Dorothy, is survived by her brothers and sister-in-law, Mabel Hott, Ken Wright, Paul Wright, and Dorothy Wildman. So, and we know Wright is Mabel's maiden name. And that Dorothy's husband was Harold R. Wright, so Mabel's brother. In addition to Dorothy um, being preceded in death by her brother-in-law, Henry R. Hott. So we know now that Henry died, or Robert Bob died, um, sometime because of him being living in the two, June 2007 obituary, but deceased by this July 2010 obituary, we now know he died somewhere between those two dates. And so once again, because of the fuller and richer names provided, we can once again spread out that family tree if we were just interested in names, dates, and places. Here's the thing. What if we were interested in the son who was mentioned in both articles? What if we were interested in Gary, who died in Vietnam? The thing with the Vietnam records is if you were to contact the National Personnel Records Center um, to obtain his Vietnam records, you would have to look at their chart to determine how you fit based on your relationship to him, based on the how long it's been since his death, um, as well as how long it's been since his service, so on and so forth. There's a lot to it. And for a lot of us, it rules us out of being able to obtain records for people. And so for the most part, these records would not be easily accessible for me to find anything about his service in Vietnam. If I was just focused on his service records, because I can find out plenty about his service. Full3 is another website or database that you can pay for at home. You can get access to it here at the Allen County Public Library, or you can check with your local library. This site is named Full3 as an indication of the folding of the flag. Has great military information, including when it first initially was launching, one of the big um, things that they made available and they made it available for free. So you don't even have to have an account to see this part of the site. 
they scanned the Vietnam War Memorial. And so you can see here the image in which the part of the memorial wall where Gary's name is featured. Along with that, they have information um, from the military pertaining to his death. So they have provided um, that he was the rank of specialist fifth class. He uh, was a helicopter repairman. He was from Fairview, West Virginia. He was a member of the Church of Christ. He was born 1948, started his tour January 1st of 69 and died 17th of September of 69. He died um, in an air crash um, on a helicopter and he was serving in Long An, South Vietnam. It was a mid-air collision and it provides you with the details of it was over the 3rd Brigade 9th Infantry Division headquarters, which is the unit he was a part of. Um, he was in the Army, and it tells you the panel and the line on the memorial wall that he is listed on. It also gives me a link to connected memorials in which people can create memorials for fallen heroes for the Vietnam War here, for example. So here's a memorial for Gary, in which in the summary section, I'm given the basic details that we saw in the other document, and also all the photographs that have been posted of him. And these photographs aren't just of him, they're of people he served with. Along with that, there is actually a link to another organization called TogetherWeServe.com in which there is, they call it a shadow box. So they have where family can put up photos, their service details have been provided. Some of this may seem like, oh, it's the same thing, but is it? I get a visual of his ribbon bar, his assignments, where he actually, like which campaigns he was a part of as well as additional information. He was killed in a mid-air collision in which it was involving the operation of um, Toe and Fang. And I had to look up that and that turns out to actually be when the Americans were responding to the Tet Offensive. And he was actually involved in what was the third part of this operation. And it took place between Saigon and the Cambodian border. And at the time, Gary was actually serving as a gunner aboard a UH-1H. It lists that 10 other individuals were on the helicopter with him at the time and that they all were deceased, as well as the crew of the other um, helicopter, the AH-1G. Now, when I searched for him in Fold 3, I was pleased to see that under another serviceman's um, memorial, Gary's name was indexed and featured. So when I actually look at Dale Jackson Crittenberger, I actually get information that's been posted here. He was um, the commander of that battalion that he, Gary was a part of. Um, it has information specific about that particular helicopter, including the number of flight hours on it, how much it was purchased for, um, the incident and accident case number for this particular incident, um, the station for the helicopter, and then it provides me the listing once again of the people who um, were killed in the crash. And then it gives me the accident summary explaining what happened that day. They were providing um, cover for the men on the ground when unfortunately the one helicopter, or the one lifted and hit the underneath left side of the, with the main rotor blade. 
leading to this accident. There are other sites when you just, once again, I'm going to say at Google, um, looking for information about this particular unit um, or for about Vietnam memorials to learn more. So this is honorstates.org in which once again, it's giving me the details, including the awards that Gary received. Tells me once again, um, birth information, um, that he enlisted when he began his tour, his service number, and then the details pertaining to the accident once again, and the listing of the people who actually were um, killed in the accident, in which when you click on each of the links, you then learn more about these men he served with and those who died. So based on these memorials, the first two gentlemen here were the pilots. William here was the crew chief and Gary was the gunner. Then there was um, the commander who was a colonel and then the major of the third battalion, as well as the ma a major and a captain of the second battalion and a major and lieutenant colonel of the fifth battalion for the ninth infantry division. Two of these men were from New York, two are from Kentucky, one from South Carolina, DC, West Virginia, Texas, Arkansas, and Michigan. One of these men were drafted, the other nine enlisted. Tours were ranging from four months to one year exactly for Dale Jackson Krittenberger. It was his last day for his tour. He had served previously in Vietnam, as well as in World War II and Korea. It's not just the one person you're looking for. So think of looking for the other people who, once again, friends, acquaintances, neighbors, the fans, those people who might be able to provide you more information on your direct ancestor. Because look at all those people that I just listed, the other nine men and the details that are provided on them, looking at these memorials. This is another site. This is um, the Wall of Faces, once again, giving the same type of details, but it actually has remembrances that people can leave for Gary. In which, here is one from a cousin. Today is your 65th birthday, Gary Lee. Today, 29th of September, 2013, would be your 65th birthday if you were here. I can't say happy because you never got to have a long life, a wife and family, and no doubt a job in the coal mine. And it goes on about the fact of the family, how difficult it has been, and how even though the cousin was almost four years old at the time of Gary's death, Gary still had an impact on him in the family. He references that in 2003, he had left a note in this page in which he talked about, it about three memorials that Gary was a part of, including giving details about a particular one in the local county where Gary was from, in which he describes that there is actually a monument there that actually has a, an actual Huey helicopter and a bronze door gunner. Um, at the um, memorial that actually has Gary's name among the other 20 something gentlemen who died from the area. And, but that for his cousin, his cousin didn't want their parents, his parents worrying because of being very aware of such. And he talks about how even at family reunions, the family still thinks of him. We also have a remembrance from his sister, Cindy, she talks about remembering their childhood, the detail about their childhood. She talks about him like, you know, picking her up in the air and because of how tall he was and playing cards and cheating at playing cards and talking about an incident in the basement thinking they fooled their parents. She was 12 when he died. She named her son Brandon Lee in memory of her brother. 
And she talks about keeping a picture of the family before she was even born, a picture of her siblings that include Gary on her living room wall in memory of him. This is the story. And then there's this one from Jack Houston. We served together for six months and I was responsible for helping Gary choose aviation. He was my door gunner. And he offers to share with the family who desperately did want to know information. One of the photographs that shows up regularly in these memorials is of Gary with Jack Houston at the helicopter. And then this one that was by Patty, the first, the person who was in that marriage announcement in which she had written up an article for the state archives um, for their cultural and history site pertaining to a memory of Gary. She talks about him being born, where he was born, talks about um, the family once again, including the fact that his father, Henry Robert, had served in the first cavalry in World War II. So this starts to show you a military trend in the family. Great pictures of him growing up, talking about riding horses, mentioning the GTO convertible, which his sister Cindy had mentioned. Guy I love, I'm sure he was probably laughing at this elementary school picture being publicly out there for everyone. And then his high school graduation picture, as well as the fact that he actually completed the Chicago Technical College engineering courses prior to joining the army and information about his basic training. Once again, information about um, the unit he served with. And then there is this. This is a statement provided by Colonel James M. Connell about what happened that day. Specialist Five Hot distinguished himself by heroic actions on September. September 17, 1969, while serving as a door gunner with the 3rd Brigade, 9th Infantry Division in the Republic of Vietnam, when elements of the 5th Battalion, 60th Infantry made contact with a well-fortified enemy force, the brigade command and control ship flew to the embattled area as the aircraft began a series of low-level passes over the enemy stronghold. Specialist Hot placed suppressive fire on the insurgents' positions. On several occasions, Specialist Hot leaned out of his aircraft, fully exposed to the deadly hostile fire, to more accurately direct intense fire on the aggressors and pinpoint enemy bunkers to the ground troops. As the helicopter maneuvered through the maze of fire, it crashed, fatally wounding Specialist Hot. His valorous actions contributed, contributed immeasurably to the success of this mission and the defeat of the hostile force. Specialist Hot's bravery, aggressiveness, and devotion to duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, the 9th Infantry Division, and the United States Army. And for these reasons, Gary Lee Hot was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. Imagine that, having that documented, as well as images of the actual memorial service that the officers in Vietnam did for the gentleman who unfortunately died in this accident. Along with the details provided here, we also learn one extra fact to fulfill the story. One of Gary's closest high school friends, Specialist Fourth Class Thomas of Fall Jr., who was also serving in Vietnam at the time of Gary's death, escorted his body home. May I please have your attention? The library will close in 30 minutes. May I please have your attention? The library will close in 30 minutes. Sorry about that announcement. So here we have, just to show you, um, going and looking not only online, but looking in the library catalog. I was curious about the 9th Infantry Division for Vietnam. Would we actually have books on that? Well, sure enough, we actually do. 
so I can go through books pertaining to the unit to be able to learn more about his passing, about not just his passing, but about his service, about what he experienced to learn his story. And then also we have a number of books pertaining to helicopters in Vietnam. So I can get a better context and understanding of what he experienced. And so this is to show you how even with what is viewed as current and difficult to be able to find actual documents, how you can expand that research, expand what you're looking for to be able to still learn more of the story. So your itinerary from this evening is to talk to your family, talk to anybody you possibly can who knew your family. Remember to look at friends, acquaintances, and neighbors for those that you're searching. Look at your previous research, reevaluate it. Look at it with fresh eyes. Start looking for family once again and follow those record trails. When you find some piece of information, write down a list of possible records that you can follow up with. Explore the community. Learn what critical events impacted your ancestor. And with all of this, you will expand your family history as well as your story.